Um, before um, I open it up to some questions, I'd like to do one more little a poem, poem thing. And I don't know if I warned you about this last night, but I wondered if we could compare um, oh, sure. William Stafford's Traveling okay. Through the Dark with your poem, a parody okay. of it, Traveling Through the Yard. Sure. And maybe since, you know, I'll use... What page is it on? Uh, traveling Through the Yard is I got it. Vail. I just saw it. I know. Okay, yeah. it's on 30. I mean, let me just say, to preface this, but I, that some, a version of what I've said to you a couple times yesterday in praise of you and your work, I find happily that your work is teachable. And usually that means it's about another writer that it's easy. Like the teachable Wallace Stevens poem is <clears throat> 13 ways of looking at a blackbird rather than description without place or some impossible poem. <clears throat> what I mean when I say you're teachable is that there is a process of understanding that is implicit and that is a collective communal understanding. We talked about this a lot. And I believe that what you've done in doing the parody of this of this Stafford poem is you've, without being ideological, too ideological, you're basically saying this is the kind of poetry that, uh, that uh, concerns me and this is the kind of poetry I'd like to write in contrast and it's very teachable. So I guess I give this, we give this to all of you to go to your classrooms to teach <laughs> this comparison. So I'll read Traveling Through the Dark by Stafford and you can read yours and okay. we can talk about it. Okay. okay, Traveling Through the Dark. Traveling through the dark, I found a deer dead on the edge of the Wilson River Road. It is usually best to roll them into the canyon. That road is narrow. To swerve might make more dead. Did I say that iambically enough? <laughs> to swerve might make more dead. <laughs> by glow of the taillight, I stumbled back of the car and stood by the heap, a doe, a recent killing. She had stiffened already, almost cold. I dragged her off. She was large in the belly. My fingers touching her side brought me the reason. Her side was warm. Her fawn lay there waiting, alive, still, never to be born. Beside that mountain road, I hesitated. The car aimed ahead its lowered parking lights. Under the hood purred the steady engine. I stood in the glare of the warm exhaust, exhaust turning red. Around our group, I could hear the wilderness listen. I thought hard for us all, my only swerving. <laughs> then, that was the sound of the doe. Um, <laughs> I thought hard for us all, my only swerving, then pushed her over the edge into the river. Okay. Traveling through the yard for William Stafford. It was lying near my back porch in the gaudy light of morning, a dove corpse, oddly featherless, alive with flies. I stopped, dustpan in hand, and heard them purr over their feast. To leave that there would make some stink. So, <laughs> so thinking hard for all of us, I, I scooped it up heaved it across the marriage counselor's fence. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> if Stafford were here, <laughs> what, what do you want to say about what troubles you or about this poem, Traveling Through the Dark, or what would you like to do instead, I guess I well, could say. Well, first I should acknowledge that, um, although I can't remember what essay or exactly what he said, that it was Bob Perlman who brought this, the Stafford poem, to my attention as, you know, egregious. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, after that, what bothers me about it? Well, it's such hubris that he thinks the wilderness is listening to him, first of all, you know. Mm. And then, of course, he's taking the responsibility to think for all of us. Right. And then, but beyond that, it's essentially a false choice because, you know, there's no chance in the world. What's he going to perform a cesarean section on the deer? And save there, the, save, save the, the deer. fawn, yeah. So there is, there is no, there's no thinking to be done. I mean, you either back, back your car down the narrow mountain road or you get the deer off the highway. <laughs> I mean, there's no choice. Right. So, and of course, the poem is seriously gendered, you know, oh, so yeah. you have this... Because he's thinking for other people who are presumably in the car with him and are yes, unable and to it's think. A, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's a mother giving birth to a child, and mm -hmm. he's got to get that out of the way. <laughs> and um, for you, it turns out that there really was a there. It wasn't oh, yeah. is a marriage. Is this the same house you're in? No. Okay, so there was a marriage counselor living next door to you. Yeah. Um, there, this, this, <laughs> is this is based on a real incident where <laughs> I actually found um, a dead dove, I guess it was, uh, that was covered with flies, and I was sweeping, and I had a dustpan in my hand. And so then, you know, uh, I don't remember how or when I thought of matching it with the Stafford poem, maybe the next day, but I obviously I've picked up some words from the Stafford poem, like purr, I think. is Purr, purr refers yeah. to, to a, a car's engine, and, and here, here it it's refers the flies, to the, the sound of the flies. And um, what else? And the iambic. When you read this poem, mm -hmm. sometimes more than others, I, we have, Pentown has a couple of versions of it, you say, to leave that there would make some stink, <laughs> yeah. and people laugh at the iambic, yeah. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you're mocking Frost as well. <laughs> That's such a frosty line. To leave that there would make some stink. <laughs> no one actually talks like that. <laughs> no, I don't. And so, and l let me see his again. Let's see. Okay. So um, he's traveling through the dark, and I'm traveling through the gaudy light of morning. And um, you're d you're seen as domestic, I guess. Yeah, and he stops and stumbles back, and I stop with my dustpan, and um, let's see, well, then there's the purring, I don't know. Anyway, it was a real incident, um, and then I think most things that I write start with something I saw, that doesn't mean that every line is based on something I saw, it doesn't mean that there's never any abstraction. But I usually start with something concrete, and in this case, that really happened, except I did not actually toss it over into the marriage counselor's yard. I waited for Chuck to come home so he could bury it. <laughs> <laughs> More civil, I think, than throwing it over the marriage counselor. Um, when you read this poem, uh, almost always, it feels to your audiences as anthemic. Um, it feels to your audiences as a chance for them to cheer a different aesthetic, one different from Stafford's. Can you try to say why it is that the community feels like this is a a, a statement about poetics? And if it is, to what extent? What do you want to say about that? Well, I, I see this as a feminist poem, and I don't think that that many of my poems are obviously feminist, but I mean, I think this is, you know, the woman in the poem, me, <clears throat> is doing something associated with housework. She's got a dustpan in her hand yeah. and, you know, um, and so it's anti, sort of anti-heroic and anti-grandiose, and um, it's a, it's comic, and you know the the woman's also imagining doing something unscrupulous, whereas Stafford's imagining doing something, you know, making the hard choices. He's the decider. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> um, <coughs> So, um, and he, oh, I know, he says to leave the, them there would make more dead, and I said to leave that there would make some stink. So <laughs> I, th I think it's funny, but I, I, you know, I am picking up on um, a lot of his material and just tweaking it, which is, I think, one reason people find it funny. Yeah, yeah good, thank you. So uh, we're going to, uh, who has the portable mic? Is it Lily? This is Lily. And by the way, while Lily's coming to Ron for a question, I just want to thank Lily Applebaum, who's done an amazing job coordinating Writers House Fellows. <laughs> thank you, Lily. Uh, let's take a few questions, starting with Ron. Uh, well, I, I have a couple, but do you I want to push the button? Is the button on? is it on? It's on yes, it's good. It, the little green thing is here. Good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, let's start with the uh, question uh, about that particular poem. One of the real differences that I heard today in that poem that I don't think I quite consciously understood previously is how much more um, pared down your version of it is. A large portion of the sentimentality that overwhelms the Stafford poem that makes it such a monument to the maudlin <laughs> is the <laughs> amount <coughs> of the amount of overwriting that goes on and on and on in it. Um, and, I mean, that seems like a real aesthetic difference between your writing and that of many people who often think of themselves as writing 
simple, plain, domestic poetry, as Stafford is mm -hmm, often mm -hmm. raised as an image of. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if that was part of what you were thinking about at the same time you were doing. I mean, you wrote this sort of around the same time you were talking about the Sharp Implement School of Writing. Um, Maybe a little earlier, but yeah, basically <clears throat> same period. Yeah. And the other one, which is, I've heard other people say at one point or another, is it, was it in your head that William Stafford was the dove? No. It, that was... <laughs> But it was apparently in Ron's head. So when you say that you've heard other people say it, you mean you hear voices. In your head. Uh, <laughs> no, that was not in my head. But I, but I very much noticed what you were say, saying when, when, um, when Al was reading the Stafford poem, I couldn't help but notice how wordy it is. It's very and wordy. How, how many lines and words I would take out of his version if, if I were writing it, which of course I did. Um, <laughs> but you know, I don't think I, I don't think I thought about that. I think I just that's just the way I write. I mean, I don't. I'm not accustomed to being verbose, so it never occurred to me to be verbose. Um, I don't think that. I mean, to me, compression is a part of good writing. In this class that I'm teaching now, um, this <laughs> weird class I'm teaching called Poetry for Physicists. Um, there's, there's something in science called the parsimony principle and also known as Occam's razor. And um, so I've been trying to talk to these science kids about how that could operate in poetry too, you know, um, where, you know, basically you, you want, there's a kind of beauty in saying as much as possible in the fewest number of, you know, equations or whatever, or words or phrases possible. And I think that's just always been, from, my, from the very first things I wrote, that's just always been my instinct. So I don't think, I mean, that's part of why I don't like the Stafford poem is because it seems wordy and unnecessarily verbose. But I don't think I consciously said, you know, I'm going to take this and strip, kind of make it more sleek because that's just, I just always do that. <laughs> 